Jesus tells eight parables in Matthew 13. The last five were told only to his inner circle. The parables shift to a picture of the sea, the life his fishermen disciples understood best. When they fished, they used different types of nets, but Jesus illustrates only one. Why only that net? Welcome to Word for the Week, Season 3, Episode 3. Join us as we discuss some surprising nuances in the parable of the dragnet and why Jesus used this net. You know, I've read a number of explanations on the parable of the dragnet, but I've never heard of anybody breaking it down this finely. So Leave why, it to me. <laughs> why, why the focus on this type of net? Well, uh, in, in the overall researching that we're doing, I found some really good stuff on the mode of fishing ancient and modern in uh, Lake Kinesaret uh, or Kine Kenneret. I'm mixing up two. There's yeah. Genesaret, <laughs> right. Kenneret, and Sea of Galilee. Mm -hmm. And so I uh, found a lot of stuff on the, the fishing in industry that uh, still goes on. And then I found a lot of theological insight. What I didn't find a lot of was an overlay of the two uh, to any great extent. And considering the parables we're looking at are the kingdom of heaven is like, I wanted to know why this net in particular. That's the question that formed in my mind. Why this net? <laughs> and uh, and thinking that if we could get down the nuance of this, what, what way might it enrich how we understand this parable, this very important parable? Sure. Well, it seems the most reasonable place to start would be to read the passage. Seems reasonable to me. As the opening shared, this parable is a conclusion in a group of seven parables, or even eight if we get technical. Right. It's the last of the kingdom of heaven is like mm -hmm. parables, which was shared privately with his disciples. Right. We shift from pearls in the water to fish. Matthew 13, 47 through 52. Once again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was let down into the lake and caught all kinds of fish. When it was full, the fishermen pulled it out on, on the shore. Then they sat down and collected the good fish in baskets, but threw the bad away. This is how it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come and separate the wicked from the righteous and throw, throw them into the blazing furnace, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And the conclusion to this parable, which goes, Have you understood all these things? Jesus asked. Yes, they replied. He said to them, Therefore, every teacher of the law who has become a disciple in the kingdom of heaven is like the owner of a house who brings out his storeroom new treasures as well as old. Right. And then what you finished with was kind of his response, which can technically be seen as an eighth parable, but it's really right. part of that seventh and final parable given to the inner circle that you have there. Mm -hmm. Now, in, in when we started this whole thing with parables in week one, we said we had to lay down the ground rules in order right. to understand properly the parables. Mm -hmm. And uh, in these parables, um, uh, of of the seven rules that we looked into, one big one came down to this: is context. If we yes. don't understand the world in which Jesus was speaking and the people he was speaking to, then we wouldn't understand the parable. Context is vital. Yes. So in um, th this episode, it's kind of a strategy we've fallen into, mm -hmm. is to focus on our, our Friday webcast on the context, and then of course we apply later. But if we do, and that's what we're staying with, and you can guess that's what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. If we're staying with this, I really got where I was breaking down into four areas, if you will, of context. Okay. One is uh, the context of the kinds of fish we're talking about. Right. Uh, the second would be the type of nets used to catch the fish. Right. The third is, and we can't get away from this, is the biblical symbolism. Right. Now, we don't want to overbake it. We don't want to go crazy with symbols, but right. we need to understand uh, the the set symbolism that's in it. I mean, that's part of being a parable. Mm -hmm. And then the fourth is linguistic or or the translation or the the words. Everything used is it really what we assume it means, or is there possibly a nuance or even a, a full other definition? Mm -hmm. 
So we're going to look in uh, language and translation as the final. So we've got those four ground rules or four areas of the ground rules that'll be important to us today as we do what we're doing. Right. And as usual, we're staying with our usual strategy. And yep. like you said, we're covering context in this episode mm -hmm. and moving on to application in the next Sunday follow-up. Yeah, so they really fall into this part one and part two thing right. going on. Well, there's just so much information to, right. to get through. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned four different areas in which we need to anchor the story if we want the real context. Right. Why don't we start with the first area? What do we know about fishing on the Sea of Galilee? And it's surprising in a number of ways is what we can find out. And the, uh, the second thing that really surprises me, it's been two millennia since we've been talking this parable. Mm -hmm. And the fishing industry is essentially the same, basically the same in the Sea of Galilee. So um, uh, what applies, applies. Okay, so tell us the kind of things that... Well, the, the way that it, it's the same as this is that the right fish to catch have always been the right fish to catch. Mm -hmm. And the wrong fish to catch <laughs> hasn't changed either. They're still the wrong type type of fish to be uh, catching. They're not desirable, I guess is right. what I would say. So. In what our article we covered, I remember it saying that there were t 24 species of fish currently in the Sea of Galilee, and of mm -hmm. those, 19 are native. Yes. So I'm going to assume there were 19 at the time of Jesus. I yeah, mean, yeah. Kind of makes sense. Not introduced yet. So first question, what were the good fish Jesus and his disciples had in mind? Yeah, because when they say good fish, bad fish, they had no trouble knowing what they were talking about. Right. And I think it's fair to assume, like we said, the good are still a good, the bad are still a bad. Mm -hmm. Uh, in the good fish, there's really three major classes of fish that this supports the fishing industry from the Sea of Galilee even now. Mm -hmm. The first type is called musht, uh, and it includes, uh, we were talking about our, our good friend Greg Arney earlier, and it says, Greg will love this, it's a favorite of his, it's a favorite of, I had it last night. Yes, it is. <laughs> yeah, but with Cajun spice, so it was really different. <laughs> yeah. But tilapia falls mm -hmm. into mush it's a medium-sized fish you know okay. uh so we have tilapia and did you know tilapia from the sea of galilee is common called saint peter's fish it's saint peter's fish not saint greg's fish just so we know it's saint, <laughs> or saint <Peter>. kevin's <laughs> saint kevin's fish <laughs> which makes sense of course we understand um peter doing so much fishing for this type of fish right. main staple um and I didn't know that, but like I say, until we researched, but it does make sense. Sense. Uh, the second type of fish is biny or barbels. Uh, and these fish are uh, much larger than the tilapia there. If, uh, if the uh, tilapia is a mid-sized car, then this is the luxury car. The barbels <laughs> are, are for bigger, and they're part of the carp family. So we have those those. Uh, fish in there as well. And there are species of these fish that are important to this day among Jewish people. Yes. They're still a main item for Sabbath meals and religious feasts, right? Yeah, so they are almost the holy fish, you know, <laughs> in, in a way. There's tilapia is the staple fish. Uh, the uh, barbels sound like they're the kind of the uh, religious fish. And then uh, I guess the next uh, type would be the, um, the uh, snack fish, and they are the <laughs> Kenneret sardines, so they, I, I would assume they named after the lake, of course, third category, smallest of uh, of these uh, three categories. Of and fish. they're usually preserved by pickling. Yes, stuff. yes. Apparently, Magdala was a center for this uh, industry. I always thought that Mary Magdala was a fishy individual. Now I know it's <laughs> biblically true. Oh, so. no. <laughs> yeah. So, mushed, biny, and sardines were good fish, so what would bad fish be? Well, the bad fish, I almost hate to bring it up because our southern brethren will be appalled oh, by this. Well, it's got to be a... Yeah, it's a, the bottom feeders. They're a type of catfish. Mm. So they're a scaleless fish, so they are off limits. Um, due to the uh, dietary, dietary, yeah, the, the laws of the Old Testament, the big no-no, can't eat catfish. And I would assume we, we've covered um, some of these, like uh, our species and subspecies of, of the, you know, in the categories we talk, yeah. but there's 19 that would have been around. So I'm assuming there were a whole bunch of those that just weren't very tasty and like nobody would want to eat them. Yeah. So, but uh, they, weren't, they weren't legally a no-no. Here we have what was good to eat, even what was religious to eat, and what uh, is uh, religious not to eat. 
-hmm. So that's the, the, the types of fish they had. Okay, so, yes, so that's the fish, okay. good and bad. How about the nets? Okay, and the nets, once again, <laughs> were three types. Um, I'm thinking uh, maybe that's not so surprising, maybe uh, because each type uh, it shines in its particular purpose and category of nets. So we do have three different types uh, work in three different ways, used in three different uh, strategies, three different purposes. And what's really amazing is you could go on Amazon right now and find a modern version uh, of at least one of these type of nets, huh, if not two. Are they all found in the Bible? Yeah, and there's examples of all three types which is amazing uh, because we're not just going back 2,000. I mean, you're you know, going back thousands beyond that. Mm. Um, and so we'll find all examples of all three types of net in, the, uh, in through the Old and New Testament. Okay, before we cover the one illustrated in the parable, what are the other two? Okay, uh, yeah, let's name the other two. We'll start with the most popular. And it's funny, you and I were talking and we both, uh, thought of the same thing. Uh, uh, one time I, I had been there in person, uh, only saw it once, these guys, uh, the Vietnamese, Vietnamese guys coming down uh, the, the uh, White Lick River Brook, whatever you call it, in the park, and they were using modern cast nets. Yeah. And the first type uh, of, of net we're talking about is the cast net, uh, and it is mentioned, if we were to look at that, uh, John uh, chapter 21, where a, a particular miracle happens there, uh, involves cast nets. And this event happened after Jesus was resurrected, and it goes like this. Mm -hmm. John 21, 1 through 11. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. And in this way, he showed himself. Simon Peter Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Canaan, Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. And they said to him, we're going to go with you also. And they went out and immediately got into the boat, and that night they caught nothing. Uh -huh. But when morning had now come, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples didn't know that it was Jesus. Then Jesus said to them, Children, have you any food? They answered him, No. And he said to them, Cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you'll find some. So they cast, and now they were not able to draw it in because of the multitude of fish. Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It's the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he had removed it, and plunged into the sea. But the other disciples came in the little boat, for they were not far from land, but about two hundred cubits, dragging the net with fish. Then as soon as they had come to land, they saw a fire of coals there, and fish laid on it and bread. And Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish which you just have, have just caught. Simon Peter went up and dragged the net to land, full of large fish, 153. And although there were so many, the net was not broken. Now, wasn't it interesting? We were talking about this, and by the mm -hmm. time we're done, hopefully everybody will end up where we are. Uh, we have no idea the amount of miracle that is going on yeah. in this. Yeah. And you wouldn't know unless you knew the fish and you knew the nets and how they were used. Right. Uh, then it becomes almost a whole other story in mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. So let's start with this. The cast net, uh, it's a, a kind of cone shape. Mm -hmm. um, it has weights on the bottom and uh, it uses and a drawstring. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, it's thrown like a, a big frisbee. frisbee it, yeah. it actually looks like a lot of fun. And apparently, give yourself a few hours and, and a person can basically learn how to do this. Mm -hmm. how, the strategy of it, how it works, it, it, it flies like this frisbee. It lands on the water and then sinks over the fish. Mm -hmm. So you're looking to try and catch, you know, school of fish, that type right. of thing. Right. Well, as it settles, you pull a drawstring. And the way I envision it is like a, an upside down bag where you kind of right. close in. So you would literally, uh, you know, bag the fish. Yeah. yeah. So... How are these nets used? Yeah, and the purpose of them, it would be like 
Uh, this is one thing you noticed in that parable, that the boats were close to shore. Mm -hmm. Makes sense, because the way these nets would work is either one individual didn't even need a boat, if you knew where there yeah, was a do it from shore, shore then, or, yeah. or just wading in waist mm -hmm. deep or something, uh, especially if you knew where there was a school of fish. Right. A couple of guys in a boat, even better, because you could look down on the water and see where the school of fish might be. Mm -hmm. And then you would do the Frisbee thing. It would land over them. You would uh, pull a drawstring. It, it would literally, you know, uh, bag the fish and you would pull them up like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, and and that's basically how it would, it would work. Hmm. Um, it says <clears throat> in the parable they were fishing at night. So how would that work finding a school of fish? In the dark. Yeah, because I was thinking of this because there were other nets that they were, they there's one in particular that is a night net. This one here, why at night? And I think this is the way it would work. Certain species of fish are drawn to light. Mm -hmm. So you have your torches, you're out there, the torches. Mm -hmm. You don't have to so much look for the school of fish. A bunch of them would start, you know, uh, congregating in there. In which case, then you could cast your net and do this whole thing and, and uh, grab them uh, and, of course, the torchlight would make the fish more visible uh, as well. So you could see what you were doing, attract the fish, and, and, and bag them at the same time, if you will. That makes it all the more unexpected in the account because it's morning when Jesus tells them to cast the net. Right? Yeah. So that's one big thing. And then they would have been a, a land breeze blowing at that time of day. Right. Yeah. So yeah. It's been harder to to get, fling well, your frisbee. <laughs> if, yeah, hard to fling the frisbee in mm -hmm. the breeze. Although I go to the parks, I see people trying all the time. <laughs> but actually, it's a, it's a couple of things going on here. In the morning, you're almost guaranteed land land breeze because um, that's physics. Is uh, by nighttime the land is cooler, the air settles, and the this, this warmer. Calm. Well, uh, the warmer water has a lower air density over it, so the the air moves from the land to the water, so it's a land breeze out hmm. to the water. So you have this going on. Well, when you have a breeze going over the water, the next thing that happens is the ripples form on the surface of the water, so it becomes very hard to see anything in the water. Oh. So you couldn't see it. It's hard to throw your Frisbee. You can't <laughs> see the fish anyway. Everything is against, especially in a those early hours, everything's against um, trying to um, to do this type of casting. As a matter of fact, uh, you know, I was thinking we live on a lake. We, you know, we have have our lake over here. When we were doing the children's uh, camp, it would be interesting that first thing in the morning. I mean, it was actually windy down there, and then within just give it a few hours when this thing comes, then it calms down but it would actually be you know pretty breezy mm -hmm. that's what these guys were facing when if they were to try and start doing casting nets at that time of the day that's interesting it also says they caught 153 large fish yeah and i noticed in our research in our day, casting nets are usually used for catching live bait, mm -hmm. which would be smaller fish. And the account says they caught large fish, implying not sardines or even tilapia, but barbels. Mm -hmm. And a barbel can reach a weight, it said, of 15 pounds. So it's possible they were pulling in nearly 2,300 pounds of fish in nets that were designed for these little sardines. Yeah. So that makes the miracle that the nets didn't break even huger. I mean, yeah, yeah. we yeah. just think, oh, they there was just so many, yeah, so, so many little fish that, you know. Hey, look, good luck out there. Yeah. <laughs> they just had some good luck. But no, yeah. no, put it all together. They were out at, the, at at a time of day now. They worked all night, so they wouldn't want to bother anyway. Right. So why they, you know, even listening to somebody, hey, cast your net, are you crazy? Not, not this time of day. Yeah. But you've got guys out there that are coming in tired, the, With the nets for little the, fish. Well, the weather is against them. Yeah. You know, the time of day is against them. Uh, as you say, they've got the uh, uh, nets that, well, if they cast for the little fish, because this is the thing, too, they were next to the shore. So that's where the little fish should have been, not the big fish. Uh -huh, so, you know, the yeah, big fish right. are out in the deep water. Right. So they wouldn't have been expecting that at all. Yeah. So here you have these guys come in, wrong time of the day wrong net, as you say, cast in these made-for-sardine nets, 
find 153 large fish, and it's this large. And remember, we said tilapia would be like midsize. The mm -hmm. large puppies were going to be the barbels or the biny, as you use. So the wrong type of fish caught in the wrong, or the wrong nets at the wrong time of day. It was just, it was absolutely crazy what happened. Yeah. And then to pull in 2,300 pounds in these little nets, it should have been a no-brainer. They should have ripped when yeah. they put they don't rip. Everything shouldn't have happened in this situation. And what makes it very interesting is that they were out there obviously looking for sardines hmm. and they caught the fish that as we covered. Say, yeah. yeah. They caught the one that was the religious fish. They, right, for Sabbath meals. Yeah, yeah, they caught they caught a miraculous Sabbath by listening to the Lord. They caught yeah. a, a miraculous religious feast by listening to the Lord in what should not have been physically, uh, environmentally, everything. It, it's just a crazy, crazy miracle. And isn't that something that's lost on us yeah. In, yeah. in our English? But understanding a little bit about the nets and everything, that's, that's yeah. what happened. Wrong yeah. net, right fish. I right. Mean, that's just... <laughs> Just, yeah, just incredible. So the cast net, the second kind of net was called a trammel net. Uh, I believe a, a gill net is sometimes a word used there. So they had this type of net as well. And what did that do? Okay. <laughs> what, kind of net what kind of net do we have going on here? Trammel net. Uh, this one goes long back, and, and it sounds, actually, as we get into it, uh, a later evolution of net, but apparently it goes a long way back in the old testament it's mentioned as far back as job and ecclesiastes mm -hmm. and job is considered uh, the oldest known book in 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 the uh, old testament so that's a long way back and mm -hmm. that uh, it does it's used in the new testament um, and we find it uh, used in in matthew for instance if you will. matthew 4 21 to 22 right. going on from there he saw two other brothers james the son of jebedee Zebedee and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. And he called them, and immediately they left their boat and their father and followed him. Why do you think this was a trammel net instead of something else? What makes you, you think that? Yeah, because we're, we're, we're making an assumption in a few places maybe are clear. But the reason we're pretty darn sure about this is because of how uh, the trammel net works. Uh, it was, if you can imagine, and first start with a net as a wall. Okay. And then think of three walls. All right. And the two outer walls would be fairly open mesh. Uh, we give you an exact measurement on that. It's out there. But fairly open. The middle one is fairly fine. It's okay. a fairly so fine. Big one, fine one, big one. Right. So or in the fine one right there in the middle. And the mm -hmm. idea of fish could come at it from either side. Mm -hmm. Very different. Fish could come at it from either side if they wanted to. The idea was they'd come in through the, the bigger net uh, mesh, hit the uh, the barrier of the center wall, mm -hmm. then realize they, they couldn't get through it, and then try and get out. And that's in trying to get back out, they would become entangled between the walls of the net and, uh, and, and then there they'd be trapped. Now this net, it would say, wouldn't have to drag all the way down to the bottom, like on the floor of the lake or the sea, uh, because it, it, wasn't, it wasn't dragging fish, it was trapping them. Trapping. Yeah. It was trapping them in there between these walls. So it was made in panels. Uh, generally, a panel of, of a tremel net would be, uh, you know, the three walls, 100 feet wide, basically 100 mm -hmm. feet. So these panels, depending on how, how big your team was and, and how, you know, how many boats you had and everything, they would take these 100-foot panels and then they would tie them together and you might have a series of them between the two boats. But the panel for each would only be 100 feet. And uh, these were used almost exclusively at night. Why at night? Um, the, the fact is, here's the difference, is that um, th since they were trapped, the idea to make them work was they, that the fish did not see the net. They would oh. come into it and not see it. Uh, and, and that way, when they, they came in, got confused, got tangled up, uh, they couldn't get back out. But it all relied on the fact that they were tricked into going in there in the first place. Uh, so, stealth. 
So it was pretty different then. It was designed to trap rather than... Right. Just, and the other nets were simply barriers that contained the fish. Right. I mean, they were they were kind of aquatic bags. They were yeah. meant to contain the, or an aquatic wall. These things were actually a design trap. And, and the thing about them, they were a great strategy and they were actually very efficient in in how they they actively engage the fish. But in being so efficient, they were also not convenient. How so? Uh, they, how so is because, um, well, you can imagine, you, you get a fish, it panics, mm -hmm. and uh, they use these in deeper water, so we're talking those big barbels. The big barbels. They get in there, they start thrashing around, uh, the, the mechanical damage to the net is going to be more significant. Yeah. Uh, so you get that going on. That and it, As we were, uh, and that's where Matthew 4 fits in, they were, what were they doing? They were mending their net. Mm -hmm. And mending, uh, the other nets needed very little mending, actually. Uh, so that is a, a real clue there. And they need a constant cleaning, like we were joking uh, earlier, said <laughs> these fish going around, if they saw their cousin Bob get caught in the <laughs> net, some of him was still in there. You weren't I'm going in there. <laughs> yeah. I'm leaving. Yeah. So the idea of staying stealthy uh, they had to they had to be constantly cleaned after every use constantly cleaned and constantly mended because as a trap uh, it wouldn't take too many holes and your trap is no longer a trap so mm. uh, that's that's how these nets fit in okay that takes us to the net in question in our parable we saw that the cast net was meant to capture schools of usually smaller fish right and the trammel would be somewhat selective mm -hmm. since certain Sea creatures wouldn't even yeah, fit through turtles, the first wall. Turtles couldn't get through. Yeah. So how was the dragnet different? Uh, it's different in this way. Uh, with the two boats going parallel to the shore, because that's the way it would be. Mm -hmm. So they're dragging uh, this this 900 foot by 25 foot wall towards the shore. And uh, they would drop the bottom so that it was literally dragging along the bottom of the 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 uh, sea floor the lake floor whatever we want to call it mm -hmm. and then the boats with this dragging uh net would head from surface to to the floor all the way into the shore hmm. oh i guess that's where it gets its name dragnet <laughs> i thought it got it from the movie uh, from the tv show but no but why was it important to drag along from the sea floor well and and that's kind of an interesting thing isn't it is because this is quite a venture to yeah. be dragging this whole wall like this but the reason they did it was because fish would instinctively dive uh, when this wall was coming at them. You know, here's a threat, dive. Right. And so the idea was if it's dragging along the bottom, there's nowhere, nowhere for them. Nowhere to go. Right, mm -hmm. Exactly. Nowhere to escape. And so they would drag this until they get with the boats till they get near the edge of the shore, at which point a, a team of up to 16 men on the shore would then uh, come in and slowly, carefully bring the net the rest of the way out of the water all the way on to a dry land and it was at that point then whatever they dragged in they would sort. That's the big difference isn't it? I mean a moving wall dragging from the seafloor to the surface would catch virtually everything that was in that area of water. Yeah and this is the and here we're getting to the clue of why Jesus used this particular uh, net is mm -hmm. it is indiscriminate it is totally inclusive it catches everything mm -hmm. fish eels turtles bottom feeders slow swimmers it doesn't matter <laughs> <laughs> we're going to get them all <laughs> and we're going to drag them into the shore and then we'll sort out uh what we got once we get it to and the there'd shore. be lots of things you didn't want of course right and the slow swimmers so that's where that sorting team would be an important part of the process i uh, think i've seen that going on at, on in places in India and and even Hawaii, I think yeah, one well, time I saw it. Yeah, like well, a whole bunch of people along the shore, yeah. all evenly bringing in their little well, their nets. Part. Yeah, yeah. Strategy of this involved, and I mean you can see it's it's almost brutally efficient in a way. If there's anything in there, but uh, ec ecologically it must have been really something. Yeah. Um, so you have them, and the big thing is the guys in the shore be working fairly quickly, too, because they're working against time. Right. Um, Keeping things fresh. 
<coughs> exactly. Um, if if you had the desirable fish, they'd be rushing to get them into pails of water mm -hmm. because they really did want to keep them alive. Well, sure. Um, and and you know fresh. And the dead uh, or the undesirable, uh, one historian says they didn't just throw them back into the water, although I'm sure that happened as well. But fitting along with the parable that uh, it, there was actually a practice of, of having fires going and throwing the undesirable fish onto these fires as a means of disposal. And it made sense in this way is that if you were fishing that parcel of land many times or over and over, mm. if you got rid of the undesirables, they wouldn't be in the water the next time, time you were fishing. Exactly, uh, and you wouldn't have to deal with them. You would end up with more of the good fish. Right. So there was a fire means of disposal, and there was the pails in which the good fish were kept. Yeah, it was a one-way trip for anything taken in the, <laughs> yeah, well, taken in the net. That was the whole thing, is that one way or the other, you're out of the water. Right. It'd be done for you, yeah. good or bad. We covered so much, and that's only two of the four areas of context you mentioned. So can you streamline the last two? Yeah, that's a hard thing to uh, ask a, a pastor to do, but we'll do our best. <laughs> All right. And, and the first thing that we'll, we'll get into is the area of symbolism. Okay, I remember in our ground rules, we need to be careful not to overanalyze the symbolism. So how do we guard against going overboard with symbolism. Yeah, because it's easy to do. Yeah. You know, it is easy to do. Um, uh, I, would, I would suggest or propose two ways that maybe. One is to watch our clever insights that look at them and say, okay, I'm seeing this symbol or that. Does that add to the central point that uh, is trying to be made? Or is it supporting the point that's going to be made? Uh, in other words, is it muddying the water or is it clearing it up? Yeah. So you could go overboard in that way. A second thing we mm -hmm. might ask ourselves in these icons, are they common themes uh, throughout Scripture or are they a clever rarity that you've seen? Mm -hmm. um, and that I, I, I'll give an example. Uh, we talked about uh, Augustine looking at the... Um, symbolism in the Good Samaritan. There was a lot of clever insights he pulls out. But by the time you looked at all of these little iconic uh, symbols that he came up with, you forgot what the main huh. point Jesus was making in the first place. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I would call that overbaking a parable. That's yeah. what I would say. All right. Well, without going overboard, then what symbolism is important to this parable? Yeah, because this one we're talking about in symbolism, is important. Uh, you won't understand this one without some symbolism. Yeah. Start out with the, the obvious or the basic. The fish obviously representing people. So right. we've got humanity yep. in the fish. Obvious number one. <laughs> okay, and, and the next is fairly obvious as well. Um, but let me uh, see if, if how you do describing this one. It says the parable, of course, begins, it's the last of the great, the kingdom, kingdom is, like. is like. Right. And... I suppose the dragnet is the first thing described, so it would represent God's kingdom. Okay, so we start with that, the dragnet, and of course it is central to the parable, right? The kingdom right. is like right. a dragnet, so we start there. But the full description in the parable starts, the dragnet is central, mm -hmm. the sea is involved, mm -hmm. the dragnet, the kingdom is like a dragnet cast into the sea, so <laughs> casting into the sea becomes important. Mm -hmm. And water or sea, uh, I'm not going to the Greek, but all the way back to the uh, original Hebrew, when we look at that concept, and, and floodwaters or sea, uh, the word ma'im, uh, it's used first in Genesis 1 when he talks about separating the waters and, and, and all of that. Mm -hmm. So the word actually means the chaos, if you were to general description, the chaos, the fluidity from which life or, or originates. Okay. So, uh, and then floodwaters in apocalyptic language, once we get into the prophets and then, of course, Revelation, refers to the mass of humanity. Anytime you see the waters flooding over this or that or coming out of the waters, it's usually referring to the mass of humanity. So putting it all together, 
the most obvious or the most uh, cohesive uh, way to look at that symbolism, it's fairly simple. The sea is the physical life in which we live. It's humanity living out life right now and in the physical life in which we exist. And if we combine with the dragnet, it would mean the kingdom of God cast into our world. Okay, and that's a good one because, like you say, if, if the net is the kingdom of God, it's the kingdom of God cast into this world. So let me ask you then, back on the spot, is then how would you describe or how would you define the kingdom of God cast into this world? God's word, God's truth, which I would say comes down from to Jesus Christ and the gospel of Christ. Yeah, so you get the gospel, you've got uh, Jesus Christ, the Messiah, coming into the world. Mm -hmm. So that this net is like the truth of God manifest in the world, right? So I'd agree and with that. And what does the shore symbolize? Yeah, the, well, and, and then it becomes kind of obvious because what is a shore? It's where... <laughs> The sea ends and the right. land begins. Right. So we've come to the end of the sea. We've come to the end of this physical life we've just described. And literally in the story, that's what happens. The net is dragged from the edge of the sea onto the shore. Mm -hmm. We talked about this this team of fishermen who then start sorting. Right. Well, in the parable, the fishermen become uh, the angels of heaven, right? Mm -hmm. Right. So then it's very much fits, then the shore becomes the afterlife or eternity. And <coughs> how about the final twist of the story? The good fish are in baskets and the bad are burned in fire. Yeah. Kind of. <laughs> right. And, and it, it fits in the, in the literal illustration, even that, as we talked about already, is the desirable fish are stored up uh, mm -hmm. and, and kept alive. And we talked about the undesirable being thrown, you know, onto a fire. And that right. that that has a theological parallel as well, doesn't it? Yeah. And maybe that might rub us wrong in our ecology-minded society. Yeah, right. but, but that's how it was done. And, of course, fire is a common picture for hell right. or the second death. Right. Now, you mentioned language and translation are also important for context. So um, what do we find there? Yeah, and we'll find it. They kind of go hand in hand here. And I'll, I'll try to be even a little a little more streamlined on this. Okay. But starting with this, the word net that's used there uh, in the original Greek was sagan, sagane, which literally does mean a drag net. So just to say that that's, there's no doubt we are talking a drag net. Right. The word baskets that we had in the translation we used is actually not quite right. Uh, the word used there, angion, means more broadly a vessel and really uh, implies um, like a pot or a pail, that type of thing. <laughs> and of course, that's this, cool. <laughs> well, it fits well because yeah. we know that's the fishermen when they were running around, they were throwing them into clay pots. Uh, or pails to, to keep them alive. Obviously, there was no flash freezing in that day. Right. You kept them alive as long as you could to get them to uh, market and keep them fresh. Wow, uh, that adds a dimension to this to the parable. Good fish are saved to life while the bad are burned away. Yeah, I mean, quite literally. Yeah, literally. That, yeah. That, that's what was happened there, uh, which leads us really to the biggest surprise in the whole language thing, mm -hmm. is in the original Greek, uh, the words, the terms used weren't actually good or bad or righteous or wicked. That's not really quite the term. Those are moral terms. I would have expected those. So yeah. um, what terms did they actually use? Yeah, and we tend to look at the parable in moral terms. Right. But in fact, they weren't really moral statements, they were existential, and people will love that. Okay, what do you mean by that? I, I mean that rather than moral as in the fish were nice fish or a rude fish or whatever, <laughs> the, what we're talking is the nature and the quality of their existence, as in we wanted to catch the tilapia, tilapia because that's what they are. Uh, that is the nature of the fish. That is the species of the fish. Uh, so in short, uh, and then also then what they become. And we'll find out in the words, it's not just what they are. It's also the condition 
of what they've become that fits in the word as well. That doesn't seem super clear. <laughs> it doesn't seem so, super clear. So maybe you could explain that. I'm, I'm staying true to the ground rules <laughs> of parables and becoming clearer all the time. Uh, but linguistically, here's what we're getting at. Okay. Remember the original word uh, for the in the Greek that was used with the pearl? It said the, the good pearl was a callus. The word used to describe the pearl a great price. Right. But doesn't the word mean ideal? That's exactly right. The word means ideal. If you remember back in the definition, it wasn't. Uh, it didn't mean it was a good pearl. It meant it was very precious. Okay. It, uh, the word meant it was beautiful in its purity, as we looked at. That's not the, a moral standing of the pearl. That's the state of its existence, the state of its being, okay. which really changes things. And, and here's where... Uh, the twist continues. Jesus doesn't use the word wicked either, and this really changes the nuance. The word he used was sapros, which means poor quality, uh, unfit, worthless. But get this, it means rotten, putrefied. The word means something that has been corrupted and mm. no longer of any use. Wow. No longer fit to use anyway. That really broadens the meaning. <clears throat> My goodness. It means a fish that is simply wrong by what it is, mm -hmm. but it can also mean a desirable type of fish that's unacceptable due to its condition. Yeah, and, and I'll tell you, it, it makes <laughs> me think of when Paul, remember when Paul says, uh, um, I, as I preach to others uh, that uh, to be careful not to, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing here, of course, <laughs> Uh, that I am not disqualified from the race myself. Yeah. And, and really, it says, here's a good fish, and they were a good fish, but now they're not fit, not because they're, the, they're not a good fish, but their condition is no longer good. And you could see that. Uh, if you looked at it literally, perhaps when you drag this dragnet onto the shore, maybe some of the fish got mangled in there. Yeah. Maybe there was good tilapia in there, but they, they caught a fungal disease or something. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but they should have been a good fish, but the condition of them makes them unfit. They are now corrupted. Wow. <laughs> so, yeah, it's the same. So exactly the idea, uh, it broadens with being uh, degraded. Uh, not only can you be the wrong thing, you can become the wrong thing and not be acceptable in the, in the uh, kingdom of heaven. Wow. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to try to put this together now. Okay, go for it. <laughs> the context of the parable is saying the kingdom of heaven is like the word of God gathering up every kind of person it encounters in, the, in this world. And it continues with all these kind of people to the end of this life. And at that point, the ideal is separated from the corrupted mm -hmm. and the ideal to jars of life and the rotten to the fires of disposal. <laughs> so it all comes down to what we are and what we become. Right. And, and, and we don't, this doesn't cause us to lose um, the idea of what we do um, <clears throat> or, or how we act because the uh, point here is a tilapia acts like a tilapia. <laughs> That's how you end up catching it in the net. Right. Um, a barbel acts like a barbel and does what a barbel does. So uh, the point is, is what you are is what you do. Uh, but it comes, it starts with what you are. Mm -hmm. And of course, the idea of what you become. So, you know, pretty good. So we looked at context. Here's how this all fit together. Right. On Sunday follow-up, then we'll look at um, how we take this and apply it. And I am going to uh, try to apply these this context in three words. That sounds like false advertising. <laughs> uh, yeah, <it's> <laughs> You've never that. given a three-word sermon ever yeah. in your life. <laughs> no, and I'm not about to start now. <laughs> so, <laughs> <figure> that. <laughs> yeah, disclaimer is that it it will be based around three very important words, but hopefully uh, making it very clear. And we take mm -hmm. the context. Now we move it into application. Okay, I'll believe that. Now, when you see it. Yeah. <laughs> now a change in topic. I'm sorry I had to miss being there, but here's the Cane and Praise team, still doing a great job on our featured song from last Sunday, My Faith Has Found a Resting Place. And until next week, 
Be blessed, and we'll see you. You can also catch our live stream on Canaan Community's Facebook, YouTube, or your favorite podcast app.